Hi, this is a conversation with Theodore Wald, who is a lawyer specialized in constitutional law. Theodore, uh, in the 21st century, which are the most dangerous threats against the constitutional system? Yeah, that's a, a, a difficult question, just because it, it, um, there are so many at this juncture. I think one of those that, um, that is of interest to me in particular is um, the decline of virtue in, in the citizenry. And what I mean by that is that um, constitutional exponents from ancient Greece through the American tradition have always believed that free government requires a citizenry that are vigilant in the practice of, of virtue. Um, and whether those virtues are courage or a prudential thinking or temperance. Um, and we kind of see that playing out right now in the American um, election, the presidential election, where so many exponents, um, political commentators have said, one way or the other, this is going to be a threat to the functioning of the constitutional system. Um, with Mrs. Clinton, you have sort of um, a pay-to-play scheme where um, there has been a lack of transparency and an obfuscation of sort of what she did and who she took money from. Um, and with Mr. Trump, there's been a lot of criticism about the rise of sort of populist anger um, and uh, his emphasis on sort of maybe casually disregarding the checks and balances in the constitutional system. But at root, both of the candidates come out of a social sort of milieu, a culture now um, that for one um, isn't always the most prudent in the way that it views uh, political affairs or the best way um, to conduct government. Um, so, you know, Václav Havel said in sort of a paraphrase, a gloss of um, St. Thomas Aquinas, that society gets the leaders that they deserve, and conversely, um, leaders get the society that they deserve. And I think we see that kind of reflexive principle right now, that um, in a self-governing republic, our leaders are representative of, of our own character and the things that we consume um, culturally and in terms of entertainment and leisure. Um, and they're also a reflection of our political aspirations or our, our lack of them. Now, uh, you mentioned prudence, but prudence should not be confused with cowardice. That's right. No, that, that's, that's exactly right. Um, that's exactly right, that there, there is an importance. Um, I think both virtues working together. Um, courage without courage, um, all the other virtues are, are sort of um, paper tigers. Um, so, but I think it's important, I, and what I mean by prudence in this context is, is that um, there, there were structural um, um, principles that the Founding Fathers, for example, created um, in, in our government in America um, even if they meant that they would provide obstacles to the efficient functioning of government. So, um, you know, whether that is uh, that, that bills of revenue originate in the House of Representatives, that it's not for the President of the United States to propose a legislative program, um, that it, that should come from the chamber that's closest to the people, um, or that there's something like the Electoral College, that just because one candidate may be popular, may be a celebrity, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only way to assure that that person rises to the highest office in the country. So um, prudence is, is a part of, of, our, of our structure and the way we conceive of government. And quite often today, um, a lot of people just want to do away with those obstacles. Um, and I, I think, uh, to your question, I think it takes a lot of courage to insist that we, we still observe and that we have a kind of reverence for these prudential checks and balances, the structure of our constitutional society. Now, is it possible to track the origins of this uh, lack of virtue among uh, voters and citizens? <laughs> um, well, I mean, at some level, politics is downstream from culture. Um, so if there is something like, um, um, what some theorists call like a moral ecology. Um, we, we live in kind of a polluted environment. Um, film and television and uh, even popular music isn't really uh, representative of the best aspirations of, of human beings. It's not necessarily ennobling. That doesn't mean that it's, not, that it's all bad or that there aren't examples of artists or um, musicians working in their disciplines, creating beautiful, inspiring art. But by and large, you know, when something like House of Cards is the most popular program 
in America and its representation of the human person and leaders in elected office is that they are vile creatures who are vice-ridden and um, you know, self-aggrandizing and uh, they pursue their own material ends over the good of the common people or of, of the constitutional structure of society. Um, people like that. They're watching that, they, they consume it, and, and it, it would be hard to argue that that doesn't in some way inform their view then um, with sort of what we would call creeping cynicism. And in this environment, people tend to dislike politicians and politics, but uh, politics is, 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 has an important role. Uh, what is the role of constitutionalism in this environment? Yeah, at some level, if, if the study of politics is like the highest science, as, as Aristotle says, um, because politics touches on all of sort of the activities of the human person, life, death, marriage, friendship. Um, if, if that's what the study of politics is, then um, constitutional theory is, is a way of structuring the best ends of government so that people can do those things. <laughs> so they can get married, so that they can raise a family, so they can um, have dinner and exchange conversation among friends, that they can grow wine grapes or uh, play an instrument. A constitutional structure of government ensures that um, Government does what it's supposed to do, and no more, so that human beings can do what they ought to do. Um, on the other hand, when Peter Thiel was awarded a honorary doctorate at UFM, he, he advised not to pay too much attention on politics, not to focus on politics. Actually, abandon this uh, practice to think always in politic, political terms. Uh, is that another form of approach? No, I, I, think, I think there's a brilliant insight there. I, I really do, because I, I think there is sort of a messianic um, view we have of politicians today, that we think somehow the election of this candidate or um, the ascendancy of this political party is going to finally bring us to the new Eden and, and assure people of a certain standard of living and access to all the, the beautiful adornments of life. And the truth is that um, those things come to, to human beings through their own labors. It's not going to be a political program or a party or some elected official. And, and yeah, so I, I would agree with Mr. Steele that really that, that at this juncture in the history of Western civilization, it's more important to cultivate meaningful relationships among friends and family in your, your, your local community, to build up um, good music and good food and good conversation, because really that's, that's the cauldron of the, the sort of the, the sitting point of, of where culture and civilization thrives. And, and in, in, in this, um, from this perspective, from the perspective of the human experience. Mm. How important is the way we study in colleges, in universities? How important is the way we study the constitution and the law? Uh, is, is, does it make a difference? Incredibly important. Um, uh, sort of the, the, the surveyor or the engineer with myopic vision is going to miss any number of mountains on the horizon. The, the topographical map that the, the scholar with blinders, uh, that map will be drawn and will miss all kinds of important things. Um, partly because um, when you become a master of a specific discipline, your map only includes um, the symbols or the, the locations that are important in that discipline. But as we know, there is no discipline that is free from connective tissue with other disciplines, with other insights and other experiences. So one of the things that makes UFM particularly different, unique as an institution, is the collaboration that exists among the different uh, scholarly pursuits or programs. Um, and that's incredibly important because it's the only way you can really achieve a whole and holistic view of the human person, that man is not just an economic creature, or man is not just a political creature, um, man is not just a cell phone talking creature, but some combination of all of those things. Um, so I, I would say that it's, it's vitally important and it's something that the Western university has lost, that a university or a, a school, a place of study should be looking at the roots and um, the full panoply of human experience. Um, 
all of it. There should be no lawyer that graduates from a law school who doesn't have an understanding of music or has some passing appreciation for art or for engineering or some of the sciences and vice versa. There should be no scientist who leaves you know, a formal uh, program in biochemistry who, who can't tell you something about uh, good literature. Theodore, thank you very much for sharing these ideas with us and thank you too.